Hello and welcome to another episode of Butterfly Kisses. I am Amy Gray Cunningham, your host, and today I have a wonderful guest. Her name is Sarah Bryan, and she is a dear friend of mine. I actually met her through some other friends of mine, and we've gotten to know each other a little bit, and she has a fabulous story, and she is, she's very, she's, get this, everyone, she is a public school teacher, yes, and she is also, she also has a degree in religious studies. So she's, uh, she's a religious educator and she has a wide, vast knowledge of so many different uh, religious backgrounds. And her main focus is in Judaism, Judaism 101. She teaches adults and she also teaches the little guys. And so I, I wanted to have her on today so she can talk with us a little bit more about her spiritual awakening and how her religious background has really kind of moved her spiritual spirituality into where she's at today and the things that kind of influence her life. So please help me welcome Sarah Bryan. Sarah, can you- Amy, thank you so much for having me um, have a conversation with you on uh, like, on your podcast. I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm excited to see where uh, spirit leads us in our conversation. Um, every conversation I've had previously has been um, more and more wonderful. And I'm grateful for the wonderful mutual friends that have brought us together. So you yeah, do. thank you for having me here. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much. How has teaching through COVID what kind of lessons have you learned and how has that affected how you, how you teach now? Wow. Um, you know, I'm still, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm still trying to unpack and process because we're still teaching through COVID. Last year, I was very, I feel very sheltered and blessed. Uh, I was able to, uh, I was teaching remotely for the whole year, all of my students were on Zoom, kind of like how we're communicating right now. Mm -hmm. So that was a great uh, challenge, opportunity. I learned things about students that, and, and learning, and especially about myself as an educator and communicator through that. I don't know if I'd ever want to go back to that again, but I could if we needed to. I think one of the most important lessons is that we learn to do things that we never thought we would have to mm -hmm. and things that we never imagined and we found new ways to do things so that now that we're on the other side of maybe that episode or that part of this process we don't come out on that journey into the same place where we left we're still we're in a new place and so that's still a struggle. Uh, the hardest part this year has been keeping our masks on. And just one more thing of reminding, you know, your, your learners, yourself, your colleagues to uh, mask up, maintain social distancing when all you really, really want to do is pull each other close and talk face to face and to be together and um, in that way. But, you know, we always have to remember like safety, like safety first. And then, so that has been a challenge. Some people are more risk averse when it comes to that. That would be me. I was at home. So I was not uh, used to having that. But still, we learned that we can project our voice while wearing a mask all day. We can play outside while wearing a mask. And I think perhaps one of the greatest gifts we will receive, or we are receiving, I'm receiving, I think the universe is receiving is not to take those simple things for granted. How did the middle schoolers, I mean, how did they manage through COVID last year? And now going back to school, have there been a lot of adjustments for them emotionally, physically, spiritually even that you've noticed? Yeah, their spiritual growth has been immense. Let's start with that. Physically, you know, I think they're literally, the time of middle school that their physical growth, that's just, it's already a very strange time in middle school. Your body betrays you constantly, slash it's a stranger. 
you know, you wake up and you have a different body than you did not so long ago. I call it recalibrating when they just don't even know like their, where their arms and legs are. That, that has remained the same. That's, you know, and that's comforting that, you know, certain things are still the same. They're still kids. They're still going through uh, adolescence. Um, but that wisdom, that spiritual growth, that they know themselves, I think, a lot deeper than I noticed that I knew myself at that age. And I'm, I'm speaking in generalizations. There's always differences, but I would say the students, they really, they know themselves and they've had more time with themselves than any other de generation. And so I, I think that's reflected in that. But that being said, they've not had to navigate the world with so many other people in it. And you know, the way that you connect within your own home or the way you navigate within your own home or with the, the small group that's that was in your like quarantine world, it's not the same as what you know you're going to be dealing with when you come out. And so I would say that I've seen a few a few fight or flight response kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, fight, flight or freeze hiccups along the way, which I think is to be expected, but beautiful resiliency and uh, just they're happy to be together. Like, I think for me, what was is the most refreshing is that these eighth graders, these are 13 and 14 year olds. They're just genuinely happy to be around one another. In general, I've been pretty lucky. They want my students this year, they want to learn. Overall, I've been blessed though. So I feel like my, my students that I teach right now, thank goodness, they seem to be doing well. You know, what I look forward to is having more of our younger students have their vaccines. And then, you know, maybe there's more hope in the spring and, you know, or by next school year that we'll have, and it will be at a different stage in the new normal. Well, you're also a single mom. So what has being a single mom through COVID taught you? Oh, that your children are your greatest treasures? Like, I don't, they are sensitive. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, the way I feel about my daughter is like, she's just the, most magical, incredible human being that has ever walked the planet. She's also very human. So we're dealing with those human six-year-old girl things. And that's been uh, interesting. I'd love to see her learn. I'd love to see how her little brain works. Uh, I'm, I've been, I was also very blessed to have, she was learning at home while I was teaching from home. So we got to have, just kind of be in each other's classrooms in different ways whether she's coming on my Zoom screen or I'm kind of, you know, eavesdropping in her um, Zoom kindergarten. But also my father came to live with us for six months. It was about this, uh, it was like September 12th, not that anybody's counting, September 12th of 2020. And thank goodness my father Lawson came from Palm Springs, California, where he had been in a, you know, California had a very restricted COVID regulations, I think very rightly so, but that was quite isolating for somebody who was alone. So he came out and stayed in, stayed and lived with us. And it was at times all, of course, challenging to be a mother and a daughter simultaneously, but it was the best memories. And my father honestly helped. He was the facilitator of my daughter's kindergarten Zoom, you know, making sure she got on the iPad, that she had the things ready, that she was listening, that she wasn't zoning out, that she didn't wander, you know, and that's a lot of adjustment for a 64 year old person or anybody. We all found these new hats that we were wearing. We were all teachers, we were all students and we were all, uh, but a lot of us, all of us were learning. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely, it was a, def it was a total new normal. My husband started working from home and that was <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Sharing space that you, in time, in a way that you weren't 
mm -hmm. sharing time. Before. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was great having him here. And, but it was different because I wasn't quite used to it. I was used to working from home because I was, I had been working from home for several years. So it wasn't that much of a transition for me, but it was a transition having him home all day. And, but it, it, it we made it work and it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing. Um, we get to see these facets of these people in our lives that we don't usually see them in that way. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I always find that to be fun, refreshing, interesting, but I'm sure, you know, like it takes adjusting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It does. But I'm grateful that I was able to have that time with him too, as well. I'm sure you were. I'm sure you were. It's really yeah. special that you had that. Yes. Yes, because we were able to get extra time and that was, that's very special. That's very special. So you also teach Judaism. Can you tell us a so little bit? I'm a bit? Jewish educator. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was a, I've been a religious educator a lot, a good bit longer than I've been a public school teacher. I would say that my time as a youth director at Temple Bethel in my mid twenties, really kind of pushed me toward teaching. It showed me that's where I had a strength. And I actually, that I enjoyed the seventh grade, eighth grade uh, niche because that was a time of a lot of like a, a heavy focus in Jewish learning with the B'nai Mitzvah year. And so I realized I really liked that age that I was you know, teaching and learning with. Um, as they are preparing for their bar and bat mitzvah to become an adult in the Jewish uh, culture, Jewish religion, Jewish community. And I like teaching early high school folks up to 10th grade for confirmation. So I was like, you know what? I actually really, really like this. I had thought I was going to be a rabbi. I think I know, I know without a doubt that my first foray into education and teaching has always been in the Jewish community from being a teacher's assistant when I was eight and eighth grader all the way through 12th grade as a madracha. And then, so I was there being a teacher assistant and oftentimes tutoring young people um, in Hebrew, learning how to tutor young people in Hebrew who have dyslexia, who are dealing with dysgraphia. And so my mother always said, you should be a teacher. You should be a teacher. She could see my natural knack and joy of it. No, 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 no. But here I am. But um, in the meantime, uh, because I'm a public school teacher, it affords me the opportunity to work summer camp over at Camp Mindy, which is part of the Levine JCC here in Charlotte. And there I get to be Maura Sarah, who is um, a Judaic art specialist. Basically, it's arts and crafts, learning uh, universal values, uh, Jewish Jewish values, but these are humanistic Jewish uh, uh, universal values, such as friendship and tikkun olam, which would be repairing the world, doing acts of loving kindness, gimilu chasadim, but also just having a really fun but distinctly Jewish experience every Friday or Shabbat. And getting to do some of my storytelling there, singing and dancing and fellowship type stuff. So that's what I do in the summer. And then I taught enough of their children that they'll let me teach their, <laughs> their parents. And then I teach elements of Judaism uh, through Temple Bethel. And this is an entry level adult course that does a very high level, meaning just like kind of, you know, bird's eye view, wide, but not a, definitely not deep enough of some of the, you know, top 10, I would say, foundations of, you know, elements of Jewish uh, life, uh, learning, and the Jewish community and faith. I've been teaching that for at least six years when I uh, started teaching, co-teaching that with um, Betsy Olinger, so. Can you tell, for those who don't know, what is, what is Shabbat? Okay, oh, great. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't uh, Shabbat is the Hebrew word. Sabbath is the English translation of the word Shabbat. Comes from the root word for seven, because it's the seventh day of creation, uh, or it's not the day of the creation. Six days of creation on the seventh day, God rested. The Hebrew word for 
Seven is Sheva, and that's where Shabbat um, comes from, and it's a day of rest. And that uh, is that begins uh, sundown on Friday and ends on sundown on Saturday. Very good. And that's usually marked with lighting of the Shabbat candles, um, making Kiddush. Kiddush comes from, it means uh, blessing the wine, but it comes from the word Kodesh, holiness. And then um, having challah, which is the braided bread and having a family meal. But, you know, it's a great day to take a nap. Um, to relax and um, also to study and to connect uh, spiritually, um, whether through pair, but also through study, through study, absolutely. So it's a day just to rest, rejuvenate. Right. It, I mean, that was on the seventh day, God rested. And so we rest too. That even God, you know, takes a day of rest um, and that we take a day of rest, our animals should have a day of rest, our workers should have a day of rest. And so it's the first, it's the beginning of the weekend. It's like, this is the origin of um, having weekends. That is actually a really good principle to live by, to be totally honest with you. I mean, just because everybody needs a day of rest and it's all about self-care as well. And, you know, God does it. So yeah, that's huge. And if we are made in the image, but Selim Elohim, if we're made in the image of God, then we too require that rest. So you talk about the 10 elements of Judaism. Can you kind of do it like a brief? Oh, the 10, well, I said 10 because I know that we do 10 sessions. Oh. Uh, so the, there is much more. I would say that there are, um, you know, there are a lot of numbers that are important in Judaism, seven or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Shabbat and then 18 for Chai, which means life. But you know, there are 613 commandments, not just 10. So that's one thing I kind of want to lift up. But um, the sessions of elements of Judaism, there's 10 of them. It focuses on what Jews believe. Uh, what is it, you know, the Jewish calendar in terms of, of the yearly cycle, but also Jewish time in terms of the Jewish life cycle events. My focus, the ones I teach, I focus on sacred texts which mm -hmm. takes you from Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, uh, which is the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh. Christian folks would know that more or less as the Old Testament, but that's the Hebrew Bible, but into Talmud and other Midrash. That is probably my, for me, it's, you know, where my two loves intersect, which would be, you know, religious studies and then and then storytelling and text studies, the language arts teacher in me. But then I also have the opportunity to try to teach as much Jewish history in 60 minutes for the history lesson. I love that one. We teach anti, I do get to teach anti-Semitism and what that, that has its own session because it is a thing that oftentimes like you can't talk about Jewish history without mentioning that. But I think Jewish history on its own deserves its own without talking about those elements so strongly and that the issue of of one of the most ancient hatreds deserves its own 60 minutes and then I get to talk about Israel and share that conversation really foster that conversation facilitate that not light topics right these are some really hard some of the more hard-hitting elements of, you know, Jewish, uh, just, just Jewish culture, Jewish experience, but it's something that I really love sharing with others because these are people who want to learn about it and who are seekers. And that is, it's a great joy to be able to learn with them. I always still get nervous to teach in front. I can teach in front of little ones all day long. And I even went from teaching adults in person to teaching on Zoom. So that was, but I still get very nervous teaching for adults because it's, it's an honor. I feel very humbled. Oftentimes my students are wiser, more experienced uh, than, than I am. So I just get to be, I, I really try to put on the hat I'm facilitating or fostering their learning experience because oftentimes I'm the student as well. That always makes for a great teacher. I try to keep it, I try to keep it open-minded and sometimes I hit the marks and sometimes I don't, but we all, we're all still learning. So thank you. 
One thing that I've learned, you know, I grew up in the Christian faith, and one of the things in the Episcopalian faith is there's a lot of rituals. And I've learned through having friends who are Jewish that there's a lot of rituals and sacred, sacred rituals. And I remember I went to, oh, it was a weekend retreat that uh, um, held. Oh, yes. The Wild Acres retreat over Labor Day weekend. Fabulous. That was a fabulous weekend. I had a great time and I was very well, I was welcomed and it was, it was, a, it was a, a great weekend. And one of the best things that I participated in was the reading of the Torah. And it went around in a circle and it was so fabulous. And it was just, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that part. It sounds like you were there when it was um, Simchat Torah, which is the it's part of the fall holiday extravaganza, which is, you know, Jewish holiday life. Simchat Torah, it falls at the end of Sukkot. This, uh, and, and, and you restart because it is a cycle. It is like a big circle. You go from the beginning in Bereshit in the beginning, um, and then you end in Deuteronomy. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's Simchat Torah, you have to reset your Torahs, right? You get to the end, you scroll, 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 scroll. You got to turn the scrolls back. And so it's a time to reset, but it's a time to like really appreciate uh, our, and I mean, our most holy object, to be honest. The word is, is key, right? God created the world through words and spoke it into existence and I mean you're supposed to even dance with the Torah it's like it, it can be that that celebratory that jubilant um but it's really amazing to see a whole Torah scroll opened up it was it was, it was, it was great <laughs> I'm glad you got to have that experience it's really it's one of them it's it's there's nothing like it yeah it was very interesting. That memory will stick with me forever because it was, I just, I've never seen anything like that before. And it's very interesting because sometimes, you know, being a Christian and we tend to forget that Jesus was actually Jewish and he studied the Torah and he studied all of, all of, he was very, and so he, he was very rich in the Jewish faith. And that is, well, I mean, it's part of the beautiful Abrahamic traditions and that have come from the, the beginning. But yeah, it's important. So my first degree is in religious studies. I and my and I think it's because of my own family background. So uh, my half of my family is Methodist or or Christian. I have a lot of good friends who were grew up Episcopalian and I've been in Episcopal a few Episcopal churches and they're beautiful. And the mm -hmm. ritual is, you know what, even though it's completely different and in some ways than Jewish ritual, it is very familiar in, in, in the, that process. I've always, that's resonated with me, but I think it's important to think about Jesus as a um, historical figure and, you know, that he would have been learned enough in the text that he comes from that particular time period that was tumultuous. And it was also like, this is a watershed moment in, um, not because of Jesus, but after his death, it wasn't much long after that, that the temple was uh, destroyed in 70 CE by Rome. And that starts the Jewish diaspora, continues the real Roman diaspora, the Jewish diaspora. This is not the first exile, but it's one that, really that we've been resonating with for the past 2000 years. One of my favorite classes was intertestamental literature. And it was looking at texts that I think some Christian uh, sects would consider apocrypha or it would, it, these are texts that may not have been canonized in Jewish uh, canon or, nor Christian canon, but really tell about a story about this time between what we know about, you know, temple Judaism and rabbinic Judaism, which is, you know, the uh, ancestor of Judaism today, and then early Christianity, 
And I think it's the words that we have from them uh, still resonate today. So I think it's really interesting to think about these times where they've had, we've had as humans, great tumult, great conflict. And it seems that the world is no longer the same afterwards. But one of the things that keeps anchoring us, regardless of religious tradition, are our words that we write down, the stories that we tell, and how we keep traditions alive. So I love it. You know, being a religious studies educator and, and studying religious background and different religions, is there is there a thread between all of the different religions? Do you think that there is from there's studying? Some, there are certain universal values that you see again and again, and and it's just following those patterns, and and it resonates not just. It can it can start. We can look at it through the faith lens, but it it's it's available to us through so many just just different archetypes that we see that resonate uh, throughout different cultures. But I would say that respect for our parents is something that is universal, and as a first step toward also appreciating our Creator or you know the substance that came before us the substance, I, I, that's more like the material, like the mother versus and father energy, I think that mm -hmm. comes up. But I think one thing that I see again and again is the concept of, you know, finding light in darkness and the concept for me that comes from the divine spark that we hear. And that actually comes from the Kabbalistic concept of creation, not the, in the beginning, God said, let there be light and there was light. There is other stories of creation in Jewish uh, tradition um, that resonate a little or that kind of um, mirror or might sound a little bit more like Big Bang Theory, but you know, uh, a singularity that pulls into this, its energy, which would be what, which would be God's energy. Everything was God before there was anything else. And everything was uh, all around Tohu Vavohu and uh, you got to organize first. So God pulled God's self in to a singularity and then sought to put that light, that divinity into Sephiro, different um, holders of this light. Mm -hmm. um, and even in that first act of creation, God, God's energy, God's divinity was too much for even those, those finely created uh they were described as vessels of clay, you know, of what is of the earth, if you think about it, big, to hold this light, and it exploded. And it's out of that explosion, that is the creation we know. And so there's this concept that there are, that the world that we know is already flawed because it was, there was a flaw, there it broke. But all of the brokenness and all of these clay shards, there are sparks of divine, these, this divine light, these, these divine sparks. And it's through mm -hmm. preparing the world, through tikkun olam, through acts of loving kindness, gimme chasadim, that we uh, reveal these divine sparks that are all around us, but are hidden in the, you know, under these shards, these clay shards. And, um, I see that concept again and again, especially as we go into the ending of daylight savings time and we're about to fall back. I think, is it tonight? We really, that darkness is so profound this time of year. And what I love about the holidays now is that it doesn't matter what, I, I see this again and again, right? It's a time that it's darker outside. So we bring light inside or we, and, and we shine our lights outside. So whether that's folks celebrating Christmas or putting up uh, luminarias or Moravian stars or our friends who are celebrating Diwali or the Festival of Lights. It's all about light in times of darkness and good prevailing over the bad. And we see that with Hanukkah, the Jewish Festival of Lights. So I just really, I try to, you know, I think that's another thing that has resonated through this past year. There are times when it was really, really dark, you know, spiritually, could feel physically that way, especially during COVID. 
And it's those sparks of light that we find in the mundane in these hardest of times that really have, that we, when we gather those sparks and we seek out those sparks, you know, we, we, are, we are then creating a better world than the one that we are finding. And so that our, what we inherited is not our legacy, that we leave behind a better world and do, and do what we can with what we have. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. I just, I mean, I think about that a lot. So I would say, you know, that light and darkness and uh, choosing either to, sometimes you have enough light that you can make your own and shine it. And sometimes you have to hold up a mirror right? Maybe you can't make your own light, but you can hold up a mirror or reflect on the light that you see in others. And that can help too. That is perfectly said. Thank you for sharing that part. Thank you for letting me say it. I will get on a soapbox about that one for <laughs> sure. I know. I, I mean, that, that, that just resonated with me because sometimes you know, wars have been fought over religion, it seems like, and people stand so firm in their beliefs about religion and what they feel is their truth and their reality. And for them, it is their truth and it is their reality. For me, there's so many different religions out there that how can they all be wrong? Yeah, absolutely. That, or how can they all be right? <laughs> it's, the same. You time. know, when I was in, uh, right before my bat mitzvah, I, I had, you know what I have, I do have a mystical spirit guide. I, remember how we were talking about that? I wasn't sure. I do have one, mm -hmm. at least. This is when she was on this side of the spirit world. And we would have these really deep conversations about, and I just remember she came from a Christian background and it was actually uh, the mother of a really good friend at this time in my life and still today, but it was just like, if God is so wonderful, doesn't God know that we all need different ways of learning and accessing the divine? And so why am I going to limit it, limit and create boundaries on our creator who obviously knows something that, you know, and so I guess at that point when I was young, I wanted to find those similarities uh, between Christianity because I had a Christian uh, family. My father's father is a Methodist minister. And so coming from, you know, the grandchild of clergy, but very, you know, but I'm about to have my bat mitzvah, that felt like a very big challenge or conundrum. And I was trying to uh, like really try to dig deeper because there's got to be a similarity. I, I couldn't understand why there couldn't be an under, you know, like I couldn't understand why we couldn't understand. And yeah. fortunately or unfortunately, usually those dives render more questions than answers uh, as they should. But what I did find is that, you know, it's the light and the good and the love that we have and that we share is what really unites us throughout all different cultures. How is this gene your spiritual awakening for you personally, knowing what you know now? I mean, knowing all of the different religions that you've studied and the, the backgrounds and the theological aspects of it, how has that, how does that affected your spiritual growth personally? Well, I think, you know, I think going back to, I think I was always kind of attuned to these type of things as even as a child. Uh, in retrospect, I remember having very like intense moments with the goodness of nature and feeling very loved by the wind. Uh, and I think kids, naturally have that the we're in tune to that energy and the, that force I, I just remember very deeply I also know that I was always asking questions and was insatiable in my curiosity of 
um, not just my own faith, but all the other different esoteric teachings and the metaphysical, I think what, I don't know. I think there, there are times uh, my, my search, my education uh, made it more difficult. Uh, perhaps uh, pushed, there were times when it pushed away. And I still think COVID is, I don't know if I, 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 I'm still kind of more of an introvert when it comes to connecting to my own spirituality. I feel far more comfortable facilitating and fostering other people's experience publicly. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's hard for me to connect that way if I'm with other people. Um, it's hard to kind of take that hat off and, and to kind of come out of educator mode. Like that, it, you know, whether it's even in spiritual times, but, and I think, I don't know, COVID has kind of solidified this introvert inside of me that I didn't know I had. But I think the awakening has more been a deepening. I think that there has been a, I was awake to what was outside. I think that I was receiving a lot of, and I was open to a lot of uploads and downloads spiritually. I think I have naturally been open and dealt with blockages before, but I, it's always harder to look within sometimes, right? Sometimes yeah. it's easy to look outside. And so I think my spiritual journey has brought me now to this place of finding the divine within myself and really uh, looking at that light. But also when you look at that light, it does cast shadows and doing what I think folks would call, oftentimes we call it shadow work. That's always, mm, you know, with the light does come shadows. Yeah. And, um, but the work in the shadow work or dealing with, uh, or actually just learning to love that part of myself has been really nurturing, really good, but it's also sometimes it's uncomfortable, right? Because it's the vulnerable parts of ourselves that we, that we mask, that we use other, you know, like, look, pay attention to the light. Don't look at this part even though people can see it. Oftentimes people can see our shadows more mm -hmm. than we can. It's hard to see the shadow if you're looking at the light. Shadow work, it's interesting that you bring up the term shadow work because that can probably be the hardest thing to, to work through because it can be the most obscure and it can kind of sneak up on you and not, you don't necessarily see it as, as easily. Sometimes the shadows blindside me. Same, same. And I, and I find that when, when, when I just move the light just a little bit more and I shine the light just a little brighter, the, the shadows kind of go into the, the, the recede a little bit more and a little bit more by looking at the shadow and shining the light there, they go away and they're not as scary or as threatening, I guess. <laughs> you know, and I would say that I, I feel like I've been pretty good about trying to work authentically and, and kind of just keeping things as real as possible. But at the same time, even in that consciousness of being real with yourself uh, and, 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 and what you portray to others, even that casts, you know, its own little shadow. So, you know, learning to love those parts of yourself that honestly, when we pay attention and shine the light there, there there's untold wealth and, and richness in that part of ourselves. And that is, that's exciting. It is still a little shaky and I don't even have words about it because I feel like I've spent a lot of time focusing on the light, which is good for me, right? That's the point and sharing that. Also knowing that as I get older, you know, those things come out and uh, oftentimes it's when your our tensions are at our best, but you know, you may not like a reaction you did or had to something and it like it blindsides you. Because you're you're coming at life with the best of intentions, and still we we fall we fall short in ways that you didn't know you were going to do it like that. You just didn't know. 
Well, I find too, though, that if you can look at things from a different perspective, it really changes the, the way that the light shines on those shadows, which makes it a little easier to digest, I guess. That's really but. interesting. Uh, we did this lesson in my class where we looked at um, MC Escher's relativity, which is this, it's, a, it's not completely ubiquitous, but it's, uh, he's this op optical illusionist. He did a lot of work with lithographs and wood, uh, wood block printing, but it essentially creates these optical illusions where it's a triangular uh, staircase structure. And it really just tells us that depending on the perspective, what seems absolutely absurd from your point of view, um, seems like gravity and norm, you know, normalcy to others. And that, that little text that I worked with uh, my public school kids with, that has really resonated in my life a lot lately. And so just even saying like, just changing perspectives um, and having that visual text to reference and, and kind of think about it in that spatial way really does help us, at least help me understand that spiritually speaking, there are dimensions we don't understand or necessarily see. And so mm -hmm. that extra relativity, even though, you know, my students and I think a lot of us, myself included, say what looks normal to you could be upside down for somebody else. But at the same time is that there are these structures and things that we don't understand, but yet we can see that it works, right? And that I think has a spiritual meaning for me that there's like that energy all around us that even though we may not be able to perceive it, it doesn't change it, that it exists. At one point in our, in our existence, everyone thought that the world was flat and they were very adamant that you would fall off the edge of the world. I mean, the world was flat and that's what they believed. Who was and, just asking me if I knew a flat earther or if I, I don't know. I think it might be the younger of our two mutual friends who was saying, didn't I have a friend who's a flat earther and it wasn't, but I don't know. I don't, I, I think everyone I'm friends with believes that the world is in fact spherical and globular, but yeah, they, I mean, some people still believe the world is flat. And, 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 it, and it's so funny because, you know, when, when, you, when you believe a certain thing, it, it, they're very adamant that that is, but that does not mean just because you don't believe it or don't see it, it doesn't make it not real. It's, I don't, you know, there are certain things that I, I don't know. I think I've, one of the things that COVID did kind of find within me is like, there is a limit to my understanding and empathy of people. I really thought that there was, and, and in a lot of ways, empathy, just like goodness. And, you know, you can always share. There's always, it's, it's, it is never ending when you share it. I, I found it very hard to put myself in the shoes of somebody who doesn't do the same for others, perhaps, or who, who may not see, but that's again, from my perspective and my reading what their life is about. But I, you know, I do, I think you can be completely spiritual and, and connected and, and also really very much believe in science and empirical data. Some of my greatest Jewish teachers, spiritual teachers are big scientists. It's hard when some people, you know, they're, it, it seems like they may not be on the same dimension, right? They're on flat. They're in 2D, right? And then some folks seem to be in 3D. But I do believe that there has to be benevolence and compassion for everyone. And this is not a Jewish value. This is more from Buddha and Bodhisattva, the concept of a Bodhisattva that in our reincarnations, we remain out of nirvana. We stay in the cycle of reincarnation to help alleviate the suffering of others. And that, yeah, some folks might still be on a 2D plane and they're not there yet. And we still have to try to dig deep and find that bodhisattva compassion, even if it, even if we don't understand it. And I'm thankful for the teachers who are bodhisattvas because um, they help us dig deeper because it is hard. You know, there have been limits to empathy. And I think that was, 
you know, when we talk about shadow work, right? I never saw myself as somebody like, oh, I have limits on my empathy, but here we go. But it's because you have to decide where is a healthy boundary for your own, for you like having empathy for oneself. For someone to incarnate and come into this world and be a mass murderer, it's hard to have empathy for someone who, who commits such a heinous crime. And how do you, how do you wrap your brain around having empathy for this person and find forgiveness? But there are mothers out there that forgive drunk drivers or murderers for murdering their children. And how do you do that? Absolutely. I, you know, it's because forgiveness is just, but one of the things I have realized about forgiveness and the things that I have learned, forgiving yourself is, I think, the hardest. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Definitely. But when we forgive others, we let go of anger and bitterness because that bitterness, that resentment, that is like drinking poison yourself and thinking it's going to kill the other person. Mm -hmm. When we forgive, yes, it, it could alleviate some of the suffering on the perpetrator or the person who wronged you, but really you are healing yourself through forgiveness. And that is something that I didn't, I'm still learning to understand that. Yeah, because it, it does alleviate the suffering, but it's, it's hard to, to see how, how, the, how people's spirit can be so great and so um, magnanimous. And that, that's, you know, when we talk about seeing light in these darkest of times, it's like that type of power that in, in forgiveness and in, in the bestower of forgiveness. Well, it goes also to, you never know what the motives are behind certain people. I mean, I've heard some people say, well, it's just plain evil and it very well could be, but in my perspective, I think that we're all here for a particular reason and we're all here to experience ourselves as divine beings. And we're all here to experience the light and the darkness in it. One lifetime, maybe I came as a serial killer. Who knows? I had to experience that part of the darkness in order to actually experience the light of being someone in love in this lifetime. I think that trying to see things in a different perspective and in a, in a different light can help me to find forgiveness for that person. Realizing that there, but by the grace of God, go I, we don't, we see these blips in people's lives. We don't see the things that precipitated other consequences that precipitated other consequences that precipitated other consequences and then add pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. Pressure can make diamonds, but it can also make volcanoes and, you know, the same, which, which in and of itself is the same thing, right? If we are made in the divine image, and especially in Judaism, this is important. I think that dualistic concept of, of good and evil, that, that, that exists, but it's, we don't have this concept of the devil or Satan in the same very stark, like that's where, uh, honestly, if, if God was everything in the beginning and all of creation is God's, that there are, there's elements that if we believe in this higher power that, you know, God is a creator and God is a destroyer and that there, that we interact with the divine, you know, there are times we experience and when we were faced with God or we have God um, in our life, it, it feels like love, but sometimes it feels like awe, uh, yura, which is also fear, right? It's love and also like wow, it's like, look at the beauty. Like, so today I did goat yoga this morning. And so, you know, here I am experiencing, I'm outside, it's cold, but it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then there's these cute little goats just hopping around and just being adorable and sweet. And they're like super well taken. Like these are pet goats. Like they smell like dog shampoo. Like they are like very frou-frou goats, sweet goats. And, and to be honest, if they were stinky goats, I would have loved them too. Here I am in my existence, uh, doing yoga with goats around me. And I, but at the same time, this is the same, 
you know, you can be in awe of and feel that love, that sweetness of creation, but you can be faced with the, the fear or the, the, the awe of, of natural disasters of like, you look at a tornado and you can't help, but just be in awe of it or a huge rushing river that you are not going to put your body in because you will, that is very dangerous, but yet very awesome and powerful. You know, it's hard that we, that when we come to realize that, you know, this creation that we are a part of, that we're reflect, refracting and reflecting this divine energy around us, but it also can include creator as well as destroyer energy, you know, and that it is a balance. And that we see these beautiful, colorful leaves and knowing that it's going to come down and become the nutrients for that tree that it just fell off of. And it's that cycle and being okay with that cycle. So knowing that, you know, when you are in the darker places, that too is a cycle that this too shall pass. But when we're having these sweet moments, right? These beautiful moments that we cherish, these bucket list moments, or even the things that we didn't know were bucket lists that you know, these beautiful memories that we, we savor those because we know those are the light and they, that they will keep us warm and, and, and lit during these colder and darker times. Yes, because we are getting ready to go into a colder and darker time, but yet at the same time, you know, we have Hanukkah and we have Christmas and we have Thanksgiving and we have families and we have, so there's, there's a lot of brightness in it as well. But we also know is sometimes in that brightness, it does cast a shadow and that, you know, we miss the ones, you know, we miss the ones that are on the other side. We miss uh, certain friendships or relationships or times in our lives. And there are times where, you know, folks are alone and it doesn't feel warm at all. So it, it does call out to us. We are blessed and that we, we got to shine it light. You know, we got to shine it brighter. We got to turn it up to 11 because that's how we transmute this. And that's how we change it, make it better. I'm excited for that. And then spring comes before you know it. And you know what? And also I guess yoga teaches you that too. They said there's going to be 15 babies by the end of February with these goats. So certain things keep marching forward. The, the, the goat yoga goats are going to have their babies and middle schoolers are still going to have to learn how to remember how to use deodorant, like certain things, you know, 13 year old boys uh, they, their voices change. Change is constant, but it is nice to have the constant of knowing that it, it is renew and that we do, and we get to be there for those seasons. And like, I think honestly, like the Jewish calendar teaches us. I think a lot of uh, religious calendars teach us that they involve the symbolism of what's going on outside in the environment. And it's, it, it, that I think is comforting. And it's something that we can look to, but sometimes it is hard. Yeah. Sometimes you get the goats and sometimes you get, sometimes you're the, sometimes you're the goat. Sometimes you're the grass. In the Christian religion on Good Friday in the Episcopal church, I remember being on the altar guild and my mother and I would go and set up the altar Mm. and Good Friday. I mean, you take you, it's bare. Everything comes off. There's nothing there. There's no flowers. There's no, it's just very stark and very cold and just very empty because, you know, that's the day that Jesus died. And then on Sunday, everything changes and there's flowers and there's lights and there's candles and there's all sorts of light. It's resplendent. It's just. So you have that, that that day of starkness and darkness, but then there's also the hope and the renewal and the the joy of having the the light come back. So there's the good and then the... Absolutely. And that feeling of, you know, of freedom, that's the same time that we're celebrating Passover, Pesach, Mm -hmm. and the Last Supper was a Passover Seder. It was a Seder meal. And in the Jewish time, we are celebrating life and, and that renewal and that redemption, but freedom from a very narrow place. The word uh, for Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, which means like a cramped or a narrow place. And we go from being very tight and narrow to this opening, um, just like the flowers uh, burst forth and there's new life everywhere. And that's when 
the people of Israel go from being a mixed multitude to being birthed as a nation. And mm-hmm. on the other side of the, the sea, then that's the beginning of the wandering, but it is this time of celebration and it is such a fun time. And I, I appreciate that symbolism for myself, but also just, I love to see it like in Christianity and in the other faith traditions that my friends and neighbors and family acknowledge and celebrate. Because I, I think that when we are in the dark times, holding on to the hope of the light and the renewal, because we are like, you you know, we are going into a season of darkness. I mean, we're turning the clocks back and it's going to be dark and it's getting cold out and, you know, the leaves are falling, but they are replenishing the trees that, so there, there is life and there is hope in everything that's going on right now. And we try to, to find the positive that sun's going to rise. Or even take that time to create it in small ways. My friend who actually went to goat yoga with, she doubled down on the, um, it's a Scandinavian, um, it's a Danish, is it a Danish term? It looks like Heige, but it's pronounced Huga. And it's about like intentional coziness. And it's from like the Nordic or Scandinavian, or I think it's Denmark, Danish this value of like making things cozy on purpose and bringing out special blankets at a certain time of year and the, the, the socks and having candles and doing your little home crafts and making certain recipes to, and these are in the like Northern hemisphere and during this time of year where it's very, very dark and light is very, very uh, scarce. Not like here it is in the Carolinas, right? Our winters are quite mild as compared to Northern Europe. But she did that when we were kind of going into that COVID world. And uh, she, my friend, Courtney, she's really taught me a lot about being intentional about like your space and how mm-hmm. that can nurture you. Yeah, huga, huga. It doesn't, H-Y-G-G-E. But yeah, intentional coziness, creating. And that's, that's another way of creating light and the darkness and creating warmth and cold times. And so I'm really looking forward to making memories in new ways, keeping new traditions, creating new traditions, but, you know, not taking. Well, I want to say thank you so much for thank joining you. today and having this conversation. And one other question that I, I ask all the guests and I'm going to ask you as well. Okay. If you have an hour to sit on a park bench with someone, whether it be someone dead or alive. Who would it be and what would you talk about? Gosh, I would probably honestly pick my great grandmother, Esther. Why do you make me cry like this? (laughs) It'd be hard. I'd miss my bubby. I would probably try to talk. I would want to sit either with Esther, the original Esther, the my great grandmother, my mother's mother's mother, or I would like to go back one more generation and and sit with Sonia, Esther's, the original Esther's mother. As a single mother, I know she wasn't a single mom, but she lived as a single mother with many, 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 many children at a time when women did not do that because her husband had already come to the new world first or not the new world, to America first for two and a half years. And I I wanted to know how she lived in those two and a half years where she's back in... Ukraine with all of these children and her husband is on the other side of an ocean. So that would probably, I would like to sit with Sonia. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your journey with us and your wealth of knowledge. It's been a pleasure. I've had so much fun. Amy, thank you so much. I really appreciated it. All right. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Butterfly Kisses, a journey of spiritual transformation. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe by hitting the subscribe button. This way you won't miss it when a new episode is released. Also join me on the Facebook page at Butterfly Kisses Podcast. Here we can continue the conversations we've been discussing on these podcasts, and you can also ask questions of our guests as well. Also, if you're interested in learning more about Akashic Record readings, you can schedule a free 15-minute consultation with me on the Facebook page or you can do so by visiting my website at amygraycunningham.com. Again, thank you. And remember, always spread your gorgeous wings, my friend, and fly.
Until next time, see ya.